He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. They say life is stranger than fiction. If you could harness the whole power of the sun using a giant lens or some sort of concave dish, you could literally melt the earth in a matter of about 60 seconds. But sometimes what we see in movies or read in books is so incredible that it obviously couldn't be possible. Or could it? They've been looking at, in serious research facilities, um, how we might actually put things up into the um, upper atmosphere in order to not obviously blow up the Earth, but to harness the power of the sun and send it down in the form of laser beams in terms of usable energy. I'm Brian Crump and welcome to Sci-Fi Sci-Fact. Here to take us through a particular MacGyver episode is Dr. Karen Thorne, a postdoctoral fellow at Victoria University of Wellington, working in the ultra-fast laser spectroscopy group. What a mouthful. But I got through that one, led by McDiamond Institute co-director Professor Justin Hodgkiss. That's right, we're about to have some MacGyver moments. MacGyver, you're torturing me. What? Well, if this is what I think it is, your Ambrose was a genius. And if that cloud would move, I'd show you why. Cloud? What does the cloud have to do with anything? I think these five artifacts together on this stone make up an optical pump. An optical pump? Yeah. When the sunlight hits this mirror, it concentrates the light into the opening here on the Holy Rose. The garment of the goddess. Yeah. Then the light bounces around the ruby. It gains some intensity from the gold surface surrounding the stone. Then the light comes out here. It gets pumped through the three lenses here on the scepters. That's the power of the Trinity. Ambrose invented an optical pump, in principle, anyway. Great. What is an optical pump? A laser. MacGyver is the inspiration of this week's sci-fi sci-fact, the intersection of science, reality and fiction. You a MacGyver fan? Oh, I, I have to say, I just love him, that mullet. <laughs> I'm I'm a I'm an eighties baby and it, it you know, it just right. brings me back to my childhood. Just, just the mullet, right? All that takes is a mullet. <laughs> I mean was was he the smartest guy in the mullet? He was generally the smartest guy in the room, so he was probably the smartest guy in the mullet too. Well he was pretty good at getting out of very sticky situations with not much um more than duct tape and some blue tack and matches and things like that. So it was actually quite inspiring. Yeah, I mean, that was the beauty of MacGyver. I was a little bit old for MacGyver, but I did get the point that he was able to get himself out of trouble by being really resourceful. And also he wasn't into guns. He wasn't a shooting up secret agent, was he? No, he wasn't. He was like the classic good guy. And um, something that I thought was really cool is that they actually had a resident physicist on the production team to advise them on, like, if this is actually possible, the stunts that he pulled off, like, could this actually be done? Right. And watching it back now that I've been, you know, through my doctorate and all that, it's quite cool to see that they've obviously put a lot of thought into, you know, how you can make something out of nothing and escape from all these, like, scrapes and disasters. And the particular MacGyver moment you've chosen is right up your alley because it's to do with laser technology, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, lots of um, what MacGyver does is involves chemistry, actually, and making bombs and all these cool things. But there's a couple of episodes where he uses optics, which is my passion, um, and one in particular where he makes this laser out of these ancient artefacts that they've found. It's a little bit Indiana Jones in its sort of theme. Yeah. Um, but I must say, when I watched it, I had a definite, oh, yeah, right, <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you actually see see it working. Right dare I then. say it? So so tell me about give give us a bit of a narrative background here before we talk about the technology, the DIY technology. What's he making a laser? Yeah, well, why is he making a laser? Well, basically it's this treasure hunt. So he's on this archaeological sort of mission. They've got these artifacts and they they're trying to lead them to some chamber somewhere where there's all this history and knowledge. And so he's collected along the way this concave silver dish. 
um, this ruby crystal and encased in this golden sort of petal-like um, ball. And then these three staffs with crystals on the top. And they come to the scene where they realise if they put them all in exactly the right place, that the sun's light will actually focus down through this mechanism and turn into a laser and then basically blow up the stone wall and reveal inside this chamber full of secrets. So that's why they want the laser, they want to blow up a wall. Well, that's where it's interesting um, because I don't think the laser would actually blow up the wall. All Hence right. the year right moment. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we better, we better get down to brass tacks then. Or, or crystals or whatever it is. So he's going to make a laser out of using energy form. He's going to use sunlight and a mirror and some crystals to make a laser, right? Have I got this right? That's exactly right. You got it. Could you ever harness enough power from the sun just by holding something up to the sun to power a laser? Yes, you definitely could. The thing is you would need to hold up something very large and um, very shiny in order to Basically, to make a laser, you need um, input energy to create the lasing beam. So the idea here is the input energy is coming from the sun. So you somehow need to gather all that energy from the sun and focus it in through this, these mechanisms in order to make this laser beam. So, yes, it, you definitely can, and there are solar lasers in existence right now. Okay, can I wind it back a bit? What is a laser beam? Okay, so a laser beam is different than just a normal light beam. So a normal light beam from the sun that we're used to looking at or a light from a torch is made up of many different colours or different wavelengths. So light is like a wave um, going up and down and up and down peaks and troughs. And depending on how far spaced apart the peaks and troughs are, you have what you call a wavelength. And so you have all different wavelengths coming from the sun. So people will be familiar with, for example, infrared, ultraviolet, microwaves. So what they all are, they're all just energy from the sun they're all just waves, but they're different wavelengths. So light from the sun is made up of all these different wavelengths, all mixed together. And that's why um, we see white light, because this, this is the visible spectrum that our eyes can see. But with a laser beam, it's different because it's just one wavelength. It's just one color, and it's directional and in a straight line going in one direction all together. And that's why it's much more energetic than just a, a white light beam from the sun. Can a laser actually make a hole in something solid? I mean, you see that in sci-fi all the time, but does it actually happen in real life? Yes, you definitely can. So depending on the power of a laser, basically if you focus the laser with some sort of lens to a point, so you're concentrating all the energy of, of the laser beam into one point, you can actually make plasma in the air or what we know as lightning. Um, so you can deionize the air, which means stripping the electrons off um, the nuclei. Um, so you can create lightning just in air if you have a powerful enough laser and you focus it to a point. So in the same context, you can easily burn through things as long as you have enough power and you focus that energy to a small area. The materials that MacGyver has, what was the best result he could possibly expect if he wasn't in Hollywood? <laughs> well, there's, the thing with MacGyver's laser is there's a couple of things that are missing. So in effect, he had this beautiful ornate silver plate that was acting as a concave mirror which was taking the sunlight and focusing it into this ruby crystal. Now you need a, a crystal medium or some sort of medium, gain medium in a laser and this is so that um, you can stimulate the emission of photons which are just small particles of light all going in the same direction all together at once which makes the laser beam. But what you need is a cavity around that laser. So the very first laser um, that was invented in the 60s basically was a ruby rod. So in this scene, MacGyver is using a ruby crystal, so that's quite realistic. But his cavity is this gold sort of circular petal dish around this ruby crystal. And now that wouldn't work because what you actually need are two mirrors either side so that the light bounces back and forth and keeps going through the, the ruby crystal and amplifying with each pass through and eventually coming out in one direction. So in MacGyver's scene, the cavity wouldn't work at all. And what you'd get is just light going out in all directions as opposed to in one line. And actually, in theory, if you did have a perfectly functioning ruby laser like MacGyver made, it could work because the sun has enough power um, to easily 
blow up a stone wall, to easily melt rock, especially if it's laced with gunpowder. But what would have been much, much easier in this scene is just to put a giant lens, um, much like those horrible kids that burn ants. Um, if you just put a giant lens in the sun's path and focus it on the gunpowder that's supposedly in this wall, it would have blown up much more effectively than this elaborate laser scheme. How big a lens would you need? Well, you wouldn't need um, too big a lens. So, so basically. What you want to do, if you put a stone wall and there's gunpowder in it, you need to heat up the gunpowder so it basically explodes. So you need to heat it up to 130 degrees for it to burn. Um, so for that, I've done a couple of little calculations. So the sun's power on Earth per square metre has is 1,000 watts per square metre. Now, to put that in a little bit of context, if you've got a laser pointer that you're um, using to do a PowerPoint presentation or whatever, that's about three milliwatts. So this is a thousand watts um, per square meter. So as long as you could focus it down to a small enough spot size, it doesn't really matter the size of the lens. It's more the focal power of the lens. So how close the lens would have to be to the gunpowder powder wall. But you can do a simple experiment, which I don't recommend, which is basically if you had some gunpowder on the ground and got a little lens and put it down on a sunny day, it would ignite. All right, I'm not going to try that at home. Well, do you know, Brian, in preparation for this um, interview, which I was looking forward to, I've been Google searching the most awful stuff, and I was thinking oh, perhaps I should be careful who's watching my Google search, you know, yeah. gunpowder, yeah. how much energy it takes to blow, blow up a planet. I figured out, actually, how we could use the sun to blow up planet Earth if we... Um, Felt really? so inclined, and how long it would could, take. Could, I we don't think my use, um, could we use a giant laser to blow up Earth? Yes, we could. So the thing with a laser, it's not so good as a weapon. So the advantages of a laser is that you can aim it very carefully, and it can go for a long, long time in one direction. But what you really want to use if you're trying to blow something up is a very high energy light source such as plasma lightning so a laser basically just heats something up but it heats it up slowly so what you can do in dream world of murdoch of macgyver the evil guy is you could basically harness if you could harness the whole power of the sun using a giant lens or some sort of concave dish you could literally melt the earth in a matter of about 60 seconds by heating it up, just by concentrating the heat from the sun through some lens or some sort of device. And actually, they've, they've been looking at in serious research facilities um, how we might actually put things up into the um, upper atmosphere in order to not obviously blow up the earth, but to harness the power of the sun and send it down in the form of laser beams in terms of usable energy. Okay. Now, I could take this conversation in several directions. Let's start with this direction. <laughs> We don't need a Death Star in Star Wars. They built the wrong thing, didn't they? They should have built a Death Lens. Actually, that's very wise of you. I think that's a very good idea. I don't reckon it would have looked as good on the on the screen, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> like it's quite giant, cool when they go pew, giant, pew. Here comes the giant monocle. <laughs> 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 but the other thing I wanted to ask you about lasers and their energy is in a laser you strip down the light to, to one one wavelength and that allows you to amplify but when you're getting your energy source if you remove all the other wavelengths from the, the light apart from the one you want to be in your laser aren't you going to remove most of the energy as well how in removing the wavelengths and just keeping one that is your laser wavelength do you maintain the energy that is going to be in that wavelength does this make sense, this question? Yes, that is a fantastic question. So basically, a laser works on the principle of what's called stimulated emission. So that's when, a, um, so in spontaneous emission, a material will absorb some wavelength and it will emit another. So if you see something that's blue, it's emitting blue light, and that's why we see it as blue. Or if you see a ruby, it's emitting light around 690 nanometers. That's why we see it as red. What the crystal does in the laser system is it absorbs particular wavelengths of light. So if you've got a whole lot of light coming in from the sun, that's all these different wavelengths. The ruby will absorb, in this case, 400 and 550 nanometers. So that's in the visible. And what happens as it, as it absorbs it, there's these energy levels within the actual crystal structure that create what we call a population inversion. And because you have this cavity, 
as the photons move back and forth between the cavity, every time that one passes through the medium, it stimulates another photon to come out with it. So they end up being friends, if you like. So one goes through, it comes out with two, and then it goes back, it comes out with three. And then back and forth you go until you get all of these photons at exactly the same wavelength, so one colour, and they're all together and all in a line. So when you talk about energy in a laser, the purpose of a laser isn't necessarily to create energetic light, it's to create what we call coherent light, which is when all of the wavelengths are the same and they're all moving together in the same time and they're all moving in one direction. If you really want high energy in a laser, you need to have what we call a pulse laser, where instead of just having this continuous stream of one colour coming out going in one direction, you can actually pack those photons into little packets of energy, like a little pulse stream, so that every single pulse contains so much energy that it can literally, as I said, if you focus it, make lightning. It can burn through things. It can do laser ablation. It has all sorts of fantastic useful purposes. So what you're doing in taking this light source that has all these different wavelengths is you're using the, the phenomenon of stimulated emission to create a laser beam all of one colour and, the, and you can make it highly energetic in the way that you set up the laser. Does it matter what wavelength, i.e. what colour, the laser is? Because wavelength determines colour, doesn't it? Yes, it absolutely does. So the crystals or the um, game medium that you use in the laser will naturally, intrinsically produce a certain colour or a certain wavelength. And that matters depending on, I guess, the application that you want to use the laser for. So the reason that the colour matters is because certain things absorb certain colours. So if you were wanting to melt something, you want it to absorb that colour. So if something is... Um, so black... Black is a good example. So the colour black will absorb everything. So that's why if you wear black clothes or you paint your house black, it will get very hot because it's absorbing all the different wavelengths. But different coloured things absorb different coloured wavelengths, sorry, different wavelengths. So that depending on what you're trying to do with it, um, so in our work, for example, going a little bit off MacGyver, we look at solar cells. So we want to get them to absorb certain colours. So you have lasers of different colours to see what happens when, for example, they absorb UV light, or when they absorb infrared light, what do they do with that? So the colour matters in terms of the application for it. So if you wanted to blow something up, if you wanted to, for example, send a laser beam from Earth into space, you would not want it in the UV because our atmosphere will absorb all of it. So you would want it, for example, in the IR so we can get past our atmosphere and out into space. That laser that you talked about before, which is incredibly powerful, but only has a burst that lasts a picosecond. If I was to put my hand in front of that laser beam, would it fry me? Uh, yes, you would be gone, Brian. Right. I, I okay. hate to be the one to tell you this. So what, um, what are we using it for? Actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure what, what they're using it for. I, I'm slightly disturbed at the um, direct combat weapons um, studies <laughs> Right. online. You've been going um, down some dark holes in the web, haven't you? I've been you? going down down some dark <laughs> holes, but th there was something that it's it's something like a trillion times the if you focus this laser into a spot, it's a billion trillion times the intensity of the sun. You know in sci-fi, you can always see the laser beam, you know, when they go oh, yes. you see the laser beam, right? Can, can you see yes. laser beams in real life? Well, that's a great question, and this is another thing from the MacGyver scene that amused me when I watched it, that not only could you see the laser beam, but you could see it moving from one point to the other. And, of course, in real life, it would move so fast, even if you could see it, you wouldn't see it. But, no, you can't see laser beams unless there's some something for them to scatter off. So, for example, if it was a very dusty day and there was lots of dust in the air, then the laser that was travelling through that dust would scatter off and you could see it. Is that, is no, that how we? Because right, it sometimes looks like I'm looking at a laser beam, but that's not what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing the laser beam. I'm seeing the dust in the air, whatever there is in the air, the light from the laser beam hitting that and being reflected towards me, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. And that's why it's okay to, like, if you see a laser beam shining on a wall, you can look at it. But why you can't point it in your eye and look at it, because then all the energy of the laser beam is going into your eye. But if you're looking at a wall, you're just seeing a tiny fraction of the energy scattering off that surface. But yes, in real life, 
in I think in the um, plasma weapons, you can see plasma. Similarly, that you can see lightning. So that's kind of different in sci-fi. But if they're talking about pure laser weaponry, no, you definitely shouldn't be able to see it, unless it's a very murky day. What about laser pointers? You know, the things that people, you mentioned them before, but sometimes people use them to, I don't know, make planes crash. Yeah, so laser pointers are really interesting because, firstly, I can't believe they sell them as cat toys. I have one and I'm thinking, well, what if this gets in my, my cat's eyes? So they've got a really low power. They're, they're milliwatts of power compared to, um, you know, your standard laser that you would use in an ultrafast spectroscopy lab is um, three watts of power. This is this is milliwatts of power. Um, so they're not technically dangerous in terms of if you po- if you point a laser pointer at a wall and a MacGyver scene with gunpowder on it, nothing would happen. But if you point it in your eye, you're basically going to get because you have a lens in your eye and it focuses the laser beam to a point on your retina, you're going to see something that's as bright as 30 times the brightness of looking directly at the sun, which we all know is very, very bad for you. And they can also travel very far. So if you point that up into the sky, it's going to travel um, travel a long, 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 long long way. It's going to go a long way. That's that's what you're trying to say, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Did you say um, cats, toys? Yeah, I've got a laser pointer... um, you know, cat toy, you make them chase it round and round and round and they can never catch it and you feel a little bit evil, um, right. to be honest. Okay, really? There's a market for that. <laughs> Did you find about that out about that on the in the dark web as well? Yeah, I went down a very dark rabbit hole there and now I've got a whole lot of products in my arsenal. Yeah, how many rabbits how many rabbits <laughs> did you meet down there with you? <laughs> Some scary stuff down there. I'm, I don't know who's crazy, the sci-fi nuts or the conspiracy theorists. <laughs> it's when they mix and cross-pollinate. we really got to worry. <laughs> and you get scientists. In terms of lasers, what do we actually use them for most of all? It's a great question. Like we, we use lasers just constantly in everyday life. So from simple things like barcode scanning, laser printing, um, things that you you take take for granted. Um, in the research realm, we use lasers for, for example, in our lab, we look at how we can make solar cells more efficient. So we use lasers to basically test solar cells. What are they going to do when they absorb photons of energy? So I think laser, laser technology is fascinating and it has just so many different um, fields that it goes into. And the really cool thing is that you can you can make them different depending on the application. So, for example, IPL, where you remove um, unwanted hair from your body using pulsed laser light. It's very effective. Um, so there's just an endless array of, of ways that we can use laser light. Let's go back to the beginning. MacGyver. So, cool. in summary, MacGyver, he would not have been able to do what he did in the show with the sunlight and his crystals and his mirror. Unfortunately, I hate to say, absolutely not. He would not have been able to do that um, unless by some miracle um, the wall that was doped with gunpowder happened to have TNT in it. And if you just looked at it, it blew up. Right. Um, but it was a really cool idea. It would have been much simpler if they just scrapped all those cool artifacts and, and, and got, you know, a lens and blown some stuff up. And the fact that you had a year right response as a scientist didn't put you off the mullet man. Oh, never. I mean, have you seen him, Brian? He's just so dreamy. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, hosted by me, Brian Crump, produced by Andrew Robertson, and, of course, made possible thanks to the incredible knowledge of those brilliant scientists at the McDiarmid Institute. You can find more episodes of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on the RNZ podcast page, RNZ's podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and iHeartRadio or pretty much wherever you find your podcasts. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss out on any new episodes.